Okay, welcome everybody to uh, another edition of Squash Canada's Coach PD webinar series. We're very, very excited to have uh, today's presentation uh, being put on by uh, Isabel Calle from uh, the Coaching Association of Canada. She is the director of the Sport Safety Department, and uh, she's going to talk about the Safe Sport uh, Movement, which uh, entails uh, a broad range of topics around the whole Safe Sport piece. Uh, including things like responsible coaching movement, rule of two and more. And so she's gonna get into those things today. Uh, we hope you take away a little bit of information on this uh, very, very valuable topic that has uh, been uh, you know, just gradually growing over the last two years in the sport, uh, the sport world. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Isabel. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to unmute and ask as we go or type in the chat, I will ask on your behalf. Um, and then there will be time at the end for uh, questions as well, if you don't want to ask during the presentation. Otherwise, uh, take it away, Isabel. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thanks for having me and thanks to Squash Canada as well. Uh, welcome everyone today. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm here in Ottawa on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And I'm very grateful to work, live and play uh, here in Ottawa. So I wanted to start by uh, just finding out who's here today. So we have, we're able to put up a quick poll just to get a bit of a feel for who's on the call. And um, like Jeff said, any questions that you have um, related to what's being presented or not, not related to what's being presented, maybe something you're experiencing um, is certainly welcome. And I'll try to answer as best I can or find the answer for you. while wow, that's coming in, just quickly, in terms of my role specifically uh, as the Director of Sports Safety, we really focus in on three main pillars, uh, the equity, diversity, and inclusion, safe sport and the responsible coaching movement, and uh, professional coaching. And so we have programs in those areas and we do a lot of work around uh, education and prevention through those programs. All right, great. So we've got, got a lot of coaches on and different roles, board, staff, and uh, other people on the call today. So great. That's awesome. I don't, I'm, I think I share the results, Jeff. I'm not sure here. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. You might as well go to your second question then and we'll. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, one thing to get started. It's not, there's no right answer, but um, just a question around what does safe sport mean to you? And I think the way the poll is set up is you can only pick one answer. So that wasn't really a trick. It's just the way that it, uh, it works in Zoom, but just to give an idea of uh, what sort of where, where you're coming from and for sure there's, there's different uh, experiences or, or thoughts out there about exactly what safe sport is. And that's one of the things that we want to continue to engage with partners and with coaches and others just to really come up with a good definition that will be a, a nice way forward for the sport community at large. And, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of a lot of the work that's been done around concussion uh, safety and prevention and education. And that's, uh, you know, been a long, long time in the works. And here in Ontario, definitely with Rowan's Law is now impacting right down at the club level, which is, which is great. And uh, I volunteer in a club and it's nice to see sort of how things trickle down from a national level to club level and, and how you interpret it and put it into uh, practice as well. So just a good different perspective there. Okay, awesome. Just share, see if this share works. And um, so physical safety, psychological, emotional, free of abuse, mental health, and well being. Awesome. Great. Thanks so much for participating in that. And so, just to move forward, we, we've done, I want to share basically for today, like I'd really like to offer a bit of a multi sport national perspective and we work very closely with our national sport partners like squash canada and we you know we are, we're also aligning with the federal government initiatives and 
um, what are what our coaches and our partners are looking for to to build and to complement the work that they're doing as well. So it's really just to share some of what we've been doing to support coaches and coach employers and our partners, and um, you know provide an opportunity for any questions that you might have as well, and hopefully provide a little bit of clarity around the, the work that's happening in the, in the movement in the system. So this this is one of the definitions that is is being used, and it's really about the prevention of maltreatment. And so a lot of the movement that's happening at the federal level is requiring all sports to provide um, codes of conduct and align with the definitions of maltreatment, allow for third party independent reviews and reporting, uh, and really just trying to build back a culture of what's being categorized as safe sport today. So today it's about the policies, the training, the procedures, the practices that we're doing to prevent maltreatment and protect all of our members. So our athletes, our coaches, our participants, our sport organizations, et cetera. And essentially that will be the focus of today. And you know, as we as as things evolve and as things sort of get through the messy middle and things start to normalize, I think this definition will change and will be really about um, sport is about a place to belong and it is inclusive and accessible and the you know the components of prevention and safe sport as we know it today will be built into that and, and people will feel those positive sport environments which they do already and will also also increase so just just to get uh just to start and this is a bit of a zooming out and just trying to reflect on the fact that sport is really connected to subsystems of health, science, culture, upbringing, and education. And sport really develops people and contributes to positive mental and physical health generally. And so these are all the contributing factors where the stakes are high when sport is not safe. And um, you know, you layer in COVID on top of that. And we had really built, built some momentum in the safe sport movement prior to COVID and through COVID. And this model here, I put it here because this really is a way for us to try to identify like the different levels of society and how they engage in safe sport and um, how it impacts the culture. And so it really goes through the spectrum of, you know, as an individual, so what are your own values? What, what are the things that attract you into sport? What is that culture like? What are those relationships that you build and what are the value systems of the people you interact with both interpersonally um, within the community or that organization and then you know within society and within policies that we create so whether it's Canadian sport policy which drives some of the funding that we can access so there's been funding around gender equity there's been funding around safety and sport um, and then you know how those policies are enforced both at a national and then all the way through the system and then you know I added the second model here because of the fact that you know, COVID has really um, had such a, an impact on our ability to participate in sport. It's obviously impacted coaches and sport organizations and um, and sort of where people are at and what are they doing in terms of being physically active or not being physically active and, and how do we better prepare ourselves to bring people back into sport again. So it's just really sort of, um, you know, layering in various elements of uh, society and where we see ourselves within it and especially if we want to change behaviors um, and that whole concept of you know learning unlearning and relearning and so those are some of the you know the buzzwords today around um, our topic today about safe safe sport and the culture so i just wanted to start with that just at a higher level of you know where how everything sort of um, is connected and you know, just how people experience the various things that um, they're engaged with in their, in their lives and enter sport too. And Jeff, please let me know if, there, if there's any questions that come through. So I just wanted to share some highlights from our safe sport journey at CAC, but also certainly with our sport partners, uh, which would include Squash Canada and um, other, you know, partners in, in federal government as well. And, Things really, um, so we hit the tipping point back in 2015. So we had existing programs and services prior to that, including um, Respect in Sport, 
make ethical decisions, our professional coaching program, which had an ethics component and the criminal record checks. Um, but the tipping point came in 2015 when um, it became known that there was another case of coach uh, abuse of a minor and um, somewhat of a, you know, a cover up, I suppose, uh, from this organization, not really doing anything to protect the athlete. And so it really led to um, our C CEO, Lorraine Lafreniere, um, partnering up with uh, the CEO at the uh, Training Center for Ethics and Sport and bringing together a sport community to have a conversation around sexual abuse in sport and um, learn lessons from Scouts Canada, having legal counsel there to talk about vicarious liability. So how an organization can be liable for the behavior of others that are affiliated with it. And really just opened up a conversation with um, Sheldon Kennedy, who went through abuse of his own um, at the hands of his coach at a young age, who didn't say anything. And then later in life, um, you know, really confronted um, how this impacted his life and, and turned it into um, trying to build a better sport community and a stronger one through respect in sport, education, training, prevention, and working with local health community and health system. So, this was just a major point in um, the work that we started to do. And the, the sport community um, got behind us and endorsed us and the CCS to, to lead through a movement to engage and prevent and educate um, the sport community. So that led to the responsible coaching movement that launched in 2016. And today we have over 900 sport organizations that have taken the pledge and have committed to the three pillars, which I'll, I'll detail a little bit more for you. And then in 2018, the Minister of Sport, which was uh, Christy Duncan, um, mandated that organizations had to disclose any abuse that was known to them, um, had to engage safe sport officers to support any reports that came in, um, provide independent third party investigations, and uh, develop and provide mandated safe sport training that aligned with what became the Universal Code of Conduct. So that, so that sort of uh, progressed into 2019, where in Redger during the games, the Canada Winter Games, all the levels of government came together to agree in principle on a way forward for safe sport. So that included the launch of the Universal Code of Conduct. It led to a consultation process um, that we, we conducted across Canada with a number of stakeholders and led to what we have today, which is the launch of the, the safe sport training in, on April 1st, 2020. There have been over 43,000 people that have taken the training. And then it led to a secondary outcome for us, which was really um, engaging the coaches and understanding where coaches were at um, to really give them a platform to address any of their concerns, hear the concerns, and try to support them as best we can. Because we do know that in sport, the coaches are the ones on the ground. They're the ones that have to implement a lot of the policies or a lot of the practices. And they're kind of between the sport organization, their employer, and the athletes and participants that they work with. And so we really felt it was an important step that we needed to take, both in high performance sports. So in conjunction with On the Podium, we, we ran a safe sport session. And then in addition to that, we worked with our partners in our Canadian sport institutes and centers and coaches that have gone through our advanced coaching diploma just to gauge where they were at and they're really working at all levels of the system. And so I want to share with you some of the outcomes of all of the engagements that we did. So it started with the, the four regional summits and we just sort of synthesized the main concerns, which was online environments. And part of that was because of the shift to moving from in-person training to online training. And so kind of going against what was originally established about trying to avoid or eliminate any sort of online interactions where possible, but really now forced to move into this virtual training environment to continue to engage athletes and participants and stay connected really. And so um, that was a concern. Um, some of the things that were coming up around false allegations. So just those opportunities where, um, you know, and it's a, very small number, but it is very, very disruptive to coaches and others when these things do surface. And, um, and the processes that have been put in place to suspend coaches and do investigation and them really feeling a lot of fear and worry over that happening and then not really knowing where to turn for support. 
um, another area is around harassment, abuse, discrimination, the fine line between sort of that, you know, pushing your athlete to the boundaries for them to be able to perform at those highest levels um, and what, you know, really trying to define what that line is. And then other things around financial challenges, so w which could be rule of two and having additional people um, and or if there's investigation, having to get a lawyer and things like that. So these things are starting to come up and creating a bit of this fear culture. And for sure, um, we've seen coaches leaving sport um, for this and for other reasons um, through COVID as well. And so, um, and one of the things too is a recommendation to increase education through the advanced coaching diploma in the areas of safe sport and really embedding that within the, the program. And then we, when we held the summit with the high performance coaches, uh, what really, really came out was clarity around the rule of two. And so that was a huge uh, eye opener for us because the program had already been in place for um, almost six years, five years, I guess, at the time. And uh, it was really, you know, starting to impact coaches in or their, their environments. And uh, there was not consistency necessarily throughout the system. So that was an area that we started to respond to, provide more webinars, have more conversations, and we're actually building a understanding the rule of two uh, e-learning module right now, which it's not going to answer every single question or scenario, but hopefully will give coaches um, some tools to, you know, prompt asking questions or just thinking a bit more about the environments that you're working within and, you know, and, and if they're really protecting you as well as a coach. Um, just the, you know, the need for coach support, application of the uh, you know, the guidelines have been put in place. So again, just in reference to rule two and other, other policies, um, as you can see, like even the suite with uh, Squash Canada, there's quite a suite of policies now. So they're there, they're transparent, um, but sometimes it's um, not sure what it looks like you know, practically in the environment. So, you know, again, just encouraging like, ongoing conversations with all the stakeholders so that people do arrive at um, processes or a way forward in terms of expectations. And then, um, you know, the feeling of it being transactional, like that coach-athlete relationship versus uh, transformational. And again, I think that's just a bit of that transition and that culture shift to the fact that, you know, our coaches are well-intentioned, our coaches are probably good and doing the best they can. And this feels more like you need to be careful and transactional. And I think it's just a bit of that transition to, it is transformational and it will continue to be. And it's just trying to adapt to our new environments. And the, the, the last thing that really came out was the need for equity, diversity, and inclusion training. And that's just that, you know, we have changing demographics. We have, um, you know, our, our athletes are more empowered. Our athletes are more self-determined. So um, it's not so much that traditional coaching model of I'm the coach, I'll tell you what to do. It's more of a kind of a co-led, co-created, co-shared, relationship now and um, and so with that shift which is very positive it's just really um, you know establishing the accountability on both parties and in a way forward and then finally we just uh, released and it's it's available to you as well but um, and we can share it we can share the, uh, the report after but we did uh, another large engagement with coaches across the full spectrum so the other two initiatives were focused on um, competitive and high-performer coaches, and this was more to understand coaches on the ground in clubs at the grassroots level. And so there were over 500 coaches surveyed, the majority of which were in the sort of development and grassroots area. And we also interviewed coaches across, so 76 interviews across nine sports um, at various levels as well. And really what came out of it was, um, you know, kind of reaffirming what we had heard about system-wide implementation. So a lot of the things that are happening right now are at the national level, the federally funded um, directly to national sport organizations, but having that need to uh, ensure that it's happening at the provincial, territorial, and club regional level as well. Um, so that's, you know, something that will take a bit of time, but certainly, you know, the processes are there. Um, just continued uh, communications around expectations. So having the policies is great and something you can turn to, but really, making sure people understand what it means and can implement it and that everyone is engaged in those conversations and is aware of how they're going to, um, you know, what's going to look like on the ground, basically. And then the other thing was around understanding the complaints process, specifically for coaches. 
And from there, just some recommendations to the CEC. So we have actually implemented some of these already. And one of them is in the, um, we have a new module called Creating Positive Support Environment. And within that, there is an entire section around having difficult conversations and using some, some tools and models and questions to help guide when you do have those conversations or when you have athletes that come to you to disclose something of a sensitive nature that, uh, that you need to respond to. So I can share some resources um, with you today as well. And just, you know, in terms of increased education for parasport, for Special Olympics, um, again, in the EDI space and working with stakeholders also outside of our national sport. So whether it's universities, colleges, again, for, you know, we really think about that system-wide implementation and uh, more training around cultural differences as well. So those are things that we are working on now and uh, into the coming years. I'm just gonna pause for a second in case there's any comments or questions. Okay. So just, I wanted to share this because when I talked about the model around um, the culture sort of embeds like all of these different people that operate within sport and I pulled some of these from our safe sport training because we do ask for um, feedback. And as you can see, like even in the first comment where this, this now coach, I'm assuming a former athlete was, um, you know, had experienced abuse and um, how the, the experience and the environment they were in was normalized. And I think that's like a major, major point of the culture of sport is how you get involved in sport, you you start to, you know, choose a sport somewhere down the road that you really love, you want to become more serious about and train more and try to, you know, really reach your potential. And then, you know, you're up against some of the cultural pieces and, you know, some of the reaction of that is, well, it's just, it's just the way this sport is, or it's just, you know, um, and, you know, if you want to be part of it, this is what it is. So I think we're starting to see changes in how people are, you know, speaking out, responding, and saying, you know what, this is not okay, and we need to change this. So um, definitely some positive steps that we're going through. And, you know, you, ever, we're all seeing a lot of um, media stories, historical stories, and even re more recent stories coming out that, um, that you know, that we, we obviously can't change what has happened, but by putting all these pieces in place to prevent it from happening in the future. And so again, it was just to highlight some of the, you know, just the, the immediate learnings from taking the training and recognizing some of the things that have been going on. So still so much more work to do in this area. And, you know, again, just wanting to reinforce the fact that we've embedded this into our, our coaching program. And it's about, you know, considerations for knowing your participants and that every participant is unique and has a different lived experience and um, even particularly in a couple of new modules we have around mental health and sport and leading a return to sport which has an element of focus around COVID but it's really trying to understand okay what are where people are coming from when they're coming into your environment and um, you know people might be hesitant to get back like 100% back into the level of sport they were at maybe before and so it's really just trying to have those really important conversations about where people are at and addressing any of their concerns or worries and letting people sort of come back into it, um, you know, as, as they need to and, and providing them that space. So we're really trying to reinforce and embed this in our coach education program as well. And it just provides a good visual, uh, you know, graphic to, to understand that. And like, if I point to the, even the emotional intelligence piece and the piece around psychological safety is is really really critical. So, um, you know, which means that you can you can speak up, like you're to not be afraid to say, you know, how you're feeling, and that there won't be um, some negative reaction to that. So, really trying to open up those environments more. And then, um, you know, I just wanted to. So, what I what I just presented was some of the more recent findings. Um, and so I'm going backwards a little bit here in terms of our timeline, but certainly just in case there are people on the call today that are not that familiar with the responsible coaching movement is really just to give sort of an overview of the fact that it's 
it's it's really based on these three steps or these three pillars of um, a framework around rule of two as a, a guiding principle uh, or a concept or an action that you can implement immediately tomorrow, today, tomorrow into your environment. Um, the background screening, which um, it's not only doing a police information check or a criminal record check, but really um, being transparent about how you're hiring coaches, how you're screening coaches, both from checking references, doing interviews, um, you know, reaching out to previous employers or previous organizations that they've been affiliated with, and not just coaches, but volunteers, others that you bring into your environment. And if if people, if you're hosting an event and you need people to drive that, you know, you would incorporate a driver's abstract into that. And um, just being clear on, you know, the roles and responsibilities that people have within your organization and the duties they're going to be performing. And then the ethics training piece is really, really critical. And there's, uh, uh, you know, a number of partners that have great training that we'll, um, I'll be able to provide to you as well today. Jeff, how are we doing here? Do we have any questions at this point? No, we've had a couple of questions around safe sport uh, training, uh, which I answered in the chat. And okay. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're going to touch on other options to get uh, training like uh, commit to kids, making headway, stuff like yeah. that. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I just wanted to sort of start with this um, because for sure we don't want to create any confusion in the system. So your, your sport organization or Squash Canada has policies and has other um, identified other procedures or processes to follow. So for sure what we're saying here is really just um, more high level considerations and anything that your sport already has in place really supersedes what I'm sharing here today or you know, anything that we really discuss or you know, bring forward. And again, just to reinforce that this was really designed for everyone. It wasn't designed to um, protect only one party within sport. And, um, you know, but we just need to recognize around the power imbalance that does exist inherently between coaches and athletes and uh, why a lot of this uh, education and prevention is put in place. And, you know, just that most of the time things are good, but when they aren't, is when things come up and we need to be ready to, to address it right away. So just to touch a bit around the background screening. And so we've created a few things uh, recently, well, we have for a number of years, but we just updated as well. So we, we updated our screening policy template. It's available on our website. And we also created a, a bit of a cheat sheet. So it's just basically some other considerations around your background screening process. So this grid is actually incorporated within that document, but it gives some additional information about the types of checks that are available for you to do, what we would recommend you do as an organization. And um, which, as an example, like the vulnerable sector check, um, a lot of sport organizations do ask for it. Um, I know I can give you a personal example. I was a volunteer soccer coach and I was asked to do police check. And um, I, you know, started coaching. And by the time I got my check, like the season was pretty much done. And so those are factors to consider when you're asking for police checks. And if you really need one, then I should, you know, like I shouldn't have been on the field of play. I had had a check done before, but I went through the, the club's process as well. But, you know, it just, it signals that it, it could potentially be a flag. And um, there are online checks that can be done within 24 hours and cover both local police check and a criminal record check in the database. It's not vulnerable sector, but vulnerable sector, um, you know, it does add another layer, but it also... Um, if you were born after 1986, there's only one person that remains in the database after that date of birth. And then all there are no more um, pardons for sexual abuse and assault of minors. So these are just some pieces of information that we incorporated there just to have, um, you know, the most efficient processes that still um, meet the standards of duty of care, but at the same time, allow people to get involved more quickly. So I just wanted to highlight some of those, but these are you know, just a grid around the level of risk of the people you're bringing into your organization and what would be required. And then, you know, as, as there's more time spent traveling and other things um, that would require more intensive uh, type screening. And then in terms of the rule of two, 
we have, um, which is the, the big area of questions and, and focus and in some cases pushback as well. So the, the idea, the concept, the principle, the rule of two is to have interactions that, and you know, environments that are open, observable and justifiable. And justifiable means they're happening within the sport environment and they're happening because it's part of how the sport needs to um, train their participants. And so, you know, again, it's really meant to protect everyone. Um, it's, you know, obviously, especially minors, but anyone, like when you're, when you turn 19 or you, know, you turn 18, you're still, you know, in that power imbalance. And it's definitely to protect everyone at, at all times. And of course, the fact that there, there could be exceptions. And when you're faced with an emergency, um, you have to do everything you can to help your athlete at that particular moment. So the idea, <coughs> excuse me, here is that essentially that there's not one athlete and one coach alone or, or a volunteer or another sport delegate. And that in order, in order to try to uphold that, that you are at least two athletes and one coach or one volunteer or one parent. And then from there, you know, more the ideal conditions would be a trained coach and a screened adult with participants or one athlete and then you know sort of like the the what we would consider our kind of our gold standard would be that you had at least two trained or certified coaches um, that were screened and working you know in that environment with an athlete or multiple athletes so just to give that kind of a high level overview of that and you know de definitely some considerations for gender you're thinking about you know you're traveling internationally for an extended period of time and things like that would be um, you know, definitely recommended as well. And for online environments, um, essentially what we have in this document is to eliminate one-on-one -on -one electronic communications. Um, but again, that would be dependent on what your sport organization is looking for or uh, suggesting or what's agreed upon by all parties involved um, and or communicated via the modes of communication within that. And then um, what we added uh, in the spring of 2020 was um, rule of two in a virtual setting. And that was, so we did that in conjunction with legal counsel. We provided to our, our national sport community because it was something that they were asking for because we really had to quickly shift everything to online. And so we built some parameters um, that could be adopted by sport organizations. So that's just, you can't really see it there in the image, but certainly it's available on our site. And, um, and in addition, just so you know, like we, we built some policy templates and we're working on a new one around um, social media and electronic communications that will provide some guidelines um, and some policy statements for organizations that would consider using it. There's tons out there already as well. And um, again, just really, you know, some ways to help with tools to implement it too. So that's going to be coming in the next couple of months. And, you know, back to the rule of two again, it's, you know, a lot of the questions we get are because it, well, if it's a rule, then a rule means you need to apply it and, you know, I haven't heard of this or I don't know what it is or, um, and so essentially, yes, like a rule for us is, it's a principle or a concept and it only really truly is a rule when your sport organization makes it a rule or a policy. And so um, uh, I, I believe that for, Squash Canada, it would be located under the athlete protection policy. Jeff, you can, you can clarify for me if that's incorrect, but. Uh, that is correct, yeah. Okay. Great, so, you know, there's different names out there and I know Swimming Canada is using open and observable places and uh, there's other, um, you know, but I think Athletics Canada is using best practices in that coach athlete in the action. So there's different different words that can be used to better express, um, you know, the, the spirit of the rule of two, and that's certainly open for adoption by any organization that chooses to, you know, take the pledge or implement any of the, um, the you know, parts of the responsible coaching movement or other policies. And so I just wanted to take a break here and just do just a bit of a, a check in here, and you know, there's there's no real wrong answer, I suppose, depending on um, your sport organization or any sort of other um, 
you know, agreed upon expectations within your, you know, the environments that you work within. But I just wanted to put this one out there in terms of, um, so just based on what you know and you've heard about the role of two, the rule of two, what, uh, what would you think about, you know, a coach and athlete that are riding to practice together? Would you see this as a violation of the rule of two? Just if anyone wants to put it in the chat or put their hand up. Jeff, I'm not going to touch my screen because I don't want to mess anything up. So if you can let me know. <laughs> so I'm seeing in the chat so far a uh, couple of people saying uh, yes, see a not acceptable. Um, we've got a hand raised. Uh, Nick, if you want to ask your question, go ahead and unmute. No, no, no. I was just raising it to, uh, to say that I don't think that's acceptable. Okay, great. Another, another yes in the chat. Okay, yeah, and you know, the way that we, you know, we would have the conversation would be, okay, so if the coach and athlete are in the car together, is that an open environment? Is it observable? Is it justifiable? And, you know, we, we get mixed responses to that, but for sure, it, you know, it definitely puts the coach at risk. Um, it, could, it could definitely be a violation of the rule of two, um and uh you know because you it's it, it is a closed environment and um you know and and by definition probably what's within the squash canada uh, policy would be something that would not be uh you know acceptable i suppose in terms of and, and also in terms of a job function right as a coach like it's it's not your job function necessarily to drive people to practices and we certainly heard a lot of that through um, these engagements that we've had with coaches too around the fact that they were driving athletes and um, now we're not not doing that so yeah so that's that's one and then in terms of the coach and athlete meeting at a coffee shop to discuss their performance goals would that be considered a violation of rule two So we've had one person say that's also a violation. Uh, a couple of no's so far. Yeah. And again, that is definitely another scenario that came up in one of our um, summits that we had. And, you know, it's, of course, it is open. I mean, you're, you know, you're in public eye, you're there. Um, it's observable. People can see that there are two people sitting there. Um, is it justifiable? And that would be a question for your sport organization. So they may say, um, please keep all interactions with your athletes within the sport environment. So in the gym, you know, uh, in the area where the court is, in the facility where, you know, you're hosting your training, um, because this could be perceived as something where you're favoring an athlete or seems, seems a bit off, seems outside of the environment. So again, it's, these are all really good. Like I, I put these there here purposely because they come up quite a bit and, you know, people have different perspectives on it. So it's definitely something like for our, from our side, we, we would um, just encourage you to have those conversations with your, your athletes, your sports, your, your teams. And, um, you know, and, and for sure, if, if, if this is something that is acceptable in your organization, then it should be documented and people are aware that it's happening. And, uh, you know, and, and it protects, again, it, it's just to reinforce, again, that it protects you as a coach. And then when you have difficult conversations with selections and things like that come up and they're not favorable um, for the athlete, um, you know, th those are those times, too, that you want to have things documented and known to others. Any so we other had a couple, of, couple yeah. of good points put in the chat, Isabel. Okay. Um, so uh, one person put, you know, suggested meet at the squash club where there are more than two people, um, which kind of reinforces what you just said about possibly meeting in the actual sport environment. Um, and then another person has just put in their age should be taken into consideration. And that's where, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the uh, Universal Code of Conduct uh, um, references 25 years of age with respect to, you know, that whole position of power. So 
age plays a role a little bit, but at the same time, the universal code does kind of outline the age piece a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's some, you know, again, that's about that, that power imbalance and position of authority that a coach would be in, regardless of age. Um, and then that age specifically around any sort of romantic or sexual relationships too. And even after the, the athlete has left that, that sport. Okay, great. Happy to take any other questions that come in on that. Um, and then the final piece that's, you know, obviously not is, is very important as well is around uh, education. And what I'm gonna do is I'll highlight some of the existing education that we have that not only us, but our partners uh, through the RCM and a couple of new things we've got coming up and uh, leave a bit of time for some questions. So I'll try to, Jeff, how much should I leave for questions? Maybe 10 minutes? Sounds perfect. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll go through this. Um, and then, so, I mean, our, our, you know, our foundational program at the CAC is the Make Ethical Decisions and NCCP is a partnership. So it's a partnership of our 65 national sport organizations and all our provincial territorial partners that deliver the NCCP. So in Ontario, that would be the Coaches Association of Ontario. And so this is a program that, or a training that is foundational to be considered an NCCP trained coach and an NCCP certified coach. So there's the training and then there's the evaluation, which is online. And so we've embedded elements of what I mentioned earlier about liability, vicarious liability, how to manage ethical situations, what's a legal situation, when do you call the police, when do you contact child protection services, and when do you navigate through this because it's an ethical, moral, issue that needs to that you need to make a decision on and be um, confident in making those decisions so that's really what this um, module is about uh, and then there's the respect in sport training and so that's also been implemented that training is um, it's i think it's been revised most like quite recently but it used to be about a three-hour module and it really delves much deeper into abuse, harassment, discrimination, and bullying in sport. And uh, it is mandatory in Manitoba, I believe also in Saskatchewan. So all coaches would need to take it in those two provinces, no matter what. And then some sports has, have also implemented it as mandatory. And I believe those sports are hockey, gymnastics, and there's some other ones for sure. Um, so that is something that um, is a requirement. I know like at the CAC, we have our CAC Space Sport training, but we actually also as an employee do the respect in the workplace training as part of our onboarding as well. So that's uh, you know pretty strong. And, I, and I, my understanding is that it was recently updated and so it aligns with the Universal Code of Conduct. And so it would have like the definitions of maltreatment that are in the code. And on top of it, it has uh, elements now built in around racism in sport and so they've you know they've updated um the training that as well there um canadian center for child protection so we've partnered with them and um they they created a module that is focused predominantly around grooming and grooming is um it's it's really this is a really like i think it's a bit of a tough module to do but at the same time i think it's really important because you know we talked about the screening and everything, but you know, you can have uh, coaches in your organization that were athletes turned coach that are, you know, they're working there and um, you may never be aware of um, this grooming process that might be happening. And that's why like ensuring that there's not online communications happening because a grooming uh, shows up a lot in social media and interacting with um, minors online and you build trust and you gain the trust of the people around you, like the parents, et cetera. And so it is it is actually quite an important module or even just, you know, being aware of how it works um, is something that, you know, I think is just important to everyone. Um, we also have a partnership with the Kids Help Phone. So um, essentially it was really to support the services they provide to minors and um, they service a lot of people obviously in Canada. And so, for us, um, you know, by promoting it through our channels, you know, increases calls potentially. And it's really, you know, they, they service people from, you know, anywhere from, you know, young, eight, nine, 10, all the way through to up to 30 years old. 
And they even added an adult texting service over COVID because they had so many calls and people were looking for help. So, um, you know, it's just another resource for you, um, for your, you know, for, for anyone that you see might have changes in behavior or other things. They have also have tons of amazing resources on their site that are available to everyone. And their number one um, calls that come in are for relationships. So again, just really important um, that, you know, people are looking for opportunities for reaching out. A um, couple of things that I also wanted to point out in case you weren't aware, I noticed on your site, Jeff, that you have a lot of our modules there. So thank you for that. And it's, it's great and it can be accessed directly from Squash Canada. Um, but we, we were fortunate to receive some funding from Public Health Agency of Canada. And uh, it was, they had a, really had put resources towards um, gender-based violence and teen dating violence in Canada as a, you know, as a national health concern and problem. And, um, and we were fortunate to be able to tap into some of that funding because of the fact that coaches are such an integral part of um, young people's lives and can have uh, an impact on listening to them and supporting them, like being able to drive them to the right uh, avenues. Not that they're expected to be the experts, but for sure someone that's trusted that they would maybe likely speak to and then cooking the coaches with some tools to be able to respond correctly and then say, here I, you know, uh, here are some other ways that we can get some support. So we launched our understanding of teen dating violence in June, and we're building the other three modules in this series. And one is around bystander empowerment, um, one around modeling healthy relationships, and another around gender-based violence and support and how that shows up. So those are underway and will be launched in June. Uh, in addition to that, we did receive money this year for um, developing and understanding those two module. Um, one around anti-racism and coaching, and another one to sort of ramp up our responsible coaching movement, do a bit of a refresh, add an informational and promotional video to quickly explain what the pillars are, and um, you know try to engage like um, and expand the reach of the movement and through um, you know grassroots and support communities across Canada. So that's going to launch in the February March timeframe as well, and we really hope we'll get. A lot more people signing on um, and then again like just in the support through sports series um, so created like these posters and the models that, which like just basically gives you that snapshot of okay if someone comes to you you know remain calm you know use this model and these are the steps you can take um, also built out some posters that um, are another way like if someone comes to you or you see something that you know here's some words you can say and um, to validate, you know, that this wasn't okay, or, you know, I, I heard that, and I'm here to support you. And, and so it's just reinforcing some of the modules we're building and providing some, some quick resources for coaches to access, which is really one of the big things that came out of all the engagements that we did across uh, Canada. And then um, this is in our locker. It doesn't look so nice on the screen, but it was just the best way to show that we have all these modules available, some of which are free, um, others which are around $15, and Making Headway is one of those. So that was our, um, it's, uh, it's the concussion um, brain injury module, and it's, uh, it was also revised a couple of years ago as well. So that is a free module that is available to, to all of you, um, as well as support through sport, the leading a return to sport, the mental health in sport, and um, well, the emergency action plan. And uh, yeah, and then uh, on top of it, Special Olympics Canada. So if you go into the locker under, if you're, it says multi-sport here, but if you clicked on, there's a drop down and it would say Special Olympics. And then they have uh, three modules and one of, one of them is around diversity and inclusion and focuses around unconscious bias. So it's a great module. And if you're looking for opportunities there, then you can access that for free on the site as well. And I think that was it, Jeff. I'm just going to leave on this note, open it up for any questions that uh, anyone has. Thank you. That was fantastic, Isabel. Thank you. Um, I can't say enough about uh, Isabel's dedication and her, uh, her group at CAC and what they've done, not just in the last year, but developing some of these uh, e-learning modules and resources. I mean, they're just pumping these things out constantly, but, uh, um, you know, what they've done in the last two to five years, as you've seen, is just amazing. Um, and as a coach myself, 
who's tapped into some of these uh, resources and uh, um, done the e-learning. They are so, so good. So if you have not done them, um, you know, I can't reiterate enough that uh, you should uh, take the time to go through them. With that being said, are there any questions? We're happy to open the floor up or uh, take them in the chat. So we've got one question here. Um, Sebastian says he's done the making headway in sports. Um, is that the concussion module you were talking about, Isabel? Yes, that's the one, yeah. Okay. Uh, I see a hand raised. Uh, Jeff Talk from Newfoundland, go ahead. Hi, Isabel, thank you for the uh, presentation. I just had a question, uh, it's a broad question really, like this is obviously an important topic, uh, but I'm just wondering if there's been any consideration to integrating the material that comes out of this area into making ethical decisions so that there's not separate modules and incremental courses that people are trying to track and required to take, given that uh, at least in our sport, like all coaches have to do making ethical decisions and we could easily expand that to other other areas. So has there been any thoughts at your end to integrating with MED? Yeah, good question. And definitely like we did a revision of the make ethical decisions, um, the online evaluation for sure this past year. And within that we did incorporate some scenarios and um, you know, some topic areas that touched on safe sport as well. And definitely responsible coaching movement. Like what we've done, every new module that we've created, we have incorporated the responsible coaching movement and rule of two and provided either scenarios or references to it just to reinforce all of the things that I spoke to you about today. So that's great comment and question. And like we are like in our module review, it's a pretty massive undertaking. So as you can see from all the modules that are just in the e-learning environment, and for sure, um, we do like about five per year. And so every five that we we uh, revise, we make sure to try to embed everything we can into them. And um, the only thing about the safe sport training I have to say is that it was, the module itself was created for the national sports system. So it was really like, it's it's open to anybody because it's it's free. And, uh, you know, there's relevant information that anybody can take away from doing the module. But, um, you know, in this sort of launch of it, it was meant to provide that service to the community to say, okay, we have this code that's universal that we want all our sports to implement. And we're adding in this training that helps support um, what that policy says and how, you know, giving examples of, you know, different I, um scenarios that uh, if you're an athlete because you take the athlete version if you're an athlete you take the coach version or you take the decision maker version like there's three versions of the training and so it's really meant to help provide additional context to the policies that we want people to follow and the duty to report and the investigation process etc so it is a bit of a one-off but for sure like um now you know as we move forward we'll start to be able to embed more as we go through revisions and updates to the module so that we yes try to link things in more to um to minimize you know obviously we encourage lifelong learning but we also understand that a lot of coaches are volunteers and have a lot of demands so where we can be more efficient we definitely will do that and you know as you said like make up for decisions is a perfect place for some of this uh, content to live Great question, Jeff. Um, I know Spider uh, had a question. I'm not sure if this is what you're going to ask. I see Spider, you've unmuted. So why don't you go ahead, Spider, and then I'll have a question from the chat after Spider's done. Hi, Isabel Spider from Yellowknife. Nice to see you again. Um, you'd mentioned in uh, one of your slides the uh, screening disclosure form. Are there some samples of that, or is there, um, I guess maybe if, if we might be getting the slides, whether those, there's a link within the slides that would get us to that location? Yeah, I will, um, I'll send it to Jeff. And do you usually send that out after Jeff or? Correct. Yeah, it is on our website, but we have a lot of pages. So it's on like, it's under sport safety, under sport organizations. So there's um, the template policy, there's the considerations, and then there's some, the disclosure form is built into the policy template. Yeah, so it's all there that you can access. And is there additionally um, a process by which you, um, work through a, a, an unclean criminal yes. record check? 
yeah, it's in the process, uh, like the considerations document. Um, like it's built into the policy for sure, but it's just additional information in terms of, um, you know, if you get a positive check or, you know, what do you do and what process do you go through in, in you know, in addition to treating, you know, each, each one uniquely, unless you have something very specific that says this is a deal breaker, no matter what. Um, and then, you know, just encouraging, like, you know, engaging with that person for more information and considering things like length of time that's gone by and, you know, no other offenses, you know, so it just depends on sort of what you have within your existing policies too. But yes, that information is there. And I understand that the uh, Canadian Centre for Sport Resolution, um, Dispute Resolution, is engaging with uh, the feds regarding uh, a third party assessment of, uh, of allegations. Do you know where that is? Yeah, so it's, it's launched. So um, SDRCC, which is actually this slide, comes from them, and that's a Sport Dispute Resolution Centre of Canada. And they have a number of programs already in place but they just won the bid for um, being the independent safe sport mechanism for sport in Canada. So what that means is that now, um, like we have sports that have their own processes built like in, so squash probably has that. Um, but what it means is that squash could now, or and or CAC can move and become part of their, um, you know, their new service where they would then do the intake of any of these, um, you know, complaints, re uh, reports that come in and go through the potentially an investigation if it's warranted. But yeah, so they would take over that service. So like, for, like what that means for, for you and everyone here is that um, instead of us going through it, so if somebody um, reports something in, they go through a third party, our third party looks, looks into it and decides if they're going to investigate or not. If they choose to investigate it, then we have to pay them to do the investigation. And um, by paying into the service, the service does it. So it's just a shift in, um, and you know, and so they're just getting set up right now, but yes, that is going to start to roll out, I think in probably May. Um, they're providing some of their existing services still like the Canadian Sport Helpline and helping, you know, if people need support because they've experienced maltreatment. Um, and then they're starting to roll out with those smaller capacity sports that don't have other things in place yet. And then we'll open it wider, you know, within the next year or so. So that's, that's you know, up and running and underway. Thank you. Great question, Spider. Um, so just being uh, conscious of the time, I'm going to make this the, the last question. Uh, it comes from Colin, uh, Executive Director from Squash BC. And this is a fantastic question to to get some uh, insight from uh, Isabel on. So question around the rule of two in the context of an enclosed squash court. Uh, would a private lesson on a court like this be a violation? Any advice on recommended setups for placing an observer? <laughs> Jeff, that's an answer. that one's for you, but <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could give you some of my you know, thoughts on it. Um, yeah, I think, any insight? Like, yeah, I mean, the, you know, I mean, every facility looks a little different, but I know like at our, our facility, um, you've got the squash courts, you've got the glass, like, you know, you can see, you can see people in there. Um, and it's, there's, it's in a public area where people are walking around. So, you know, it technically could be considered an open and observable space and obviously justifiable because either, you know, people are aware that there are lessons happening in the space. They have the ability to see what's going on. Um, they have, like there's other people maybe working in the facility that are around. So if, if that is something that is acceptable uh, practice within your organization with your, you know, the parents, the guardians, the sport organization, um, you know, yourselves or whoever, then, you know, that that's definitely something that um, is, is good to consider a revisit, but at the same time, um, you know, it could be as long as you've got the duty of care, people know that people are, you know, that you're practicing, um, that would, that would likely seem to be reasonable and justifiable. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks as well. And thanks to the, uh, Colin for that great question. Um, just as a thought, uh, Squash Canada does have a screening policy, but we also do have, as Isabel mentioned, we do have an athlete protection policy that, um, I will share with everybody that attended. 
uh, when I send out the uh, PowerPoint slides and the video recording, um, have a read of that. And for the PT reps that are on the call, like Colin and uh, Spider from our PTs, um, maybe on our next PT town hall, this is a topic of discussion that we can have um, if, uh, if you feel there's more um, defining needing in our athlete protection policy. Um, but otherwise, other than that, uh, I'd like to thank Isabel for her fantastic presentation today. Uh, I would imagine everybody took a little bit of something away from uh, today's presentation on this very, very key topic in sport. And uh, we thank you for your time uh, for attending. I will put in the CSC locker this, uh, this afternoon the uh, presentation. So you'll get your PD point probably today or tomorrow. And the uh, video recording and PowerPoint slides will come out later today or tomorrow. With that being said, we do have one more Coach PD webinar scheduled in a couple of weeks on Wednesday, December 15th. Uh, it is risk management for coaches and registration is now open. And we've also made this one free. So I encourage everybody to register for that one as well. Again, thank you, Isabel. Thank you everybody for attending and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Jeff.